Uh, today we're going we're gonna to finish the series out of 2 Kings chapter number 5. hope you've enjoyed this series. I know I certainly have enjoyed uh, writing it and uh, immersing myself in 2 Kings chapter number 5. Uh, looking at the idea of faith, and we've looked at various different aspects of faith through the characters that are told in this story of a, a wealthy man by the name of Naaman, a Syrian general who had leprosy, and uh, through simple faith, uh, he has an encounter with God through the prophet Elisha and is healed. Um, and in the story, we've first looked at the wrong faith, which was typified by Naaman himself before his conversion. Um, and then he gets saved. And then uh, we looked at strong faith and just the opposite kind of character. We looked at a little slave girl and her tremendous faith. And then we looked at the right faith. And last week, we looked at the prophet Elisha and uh, looked at the idea of the life of the believer. Uh, what is the right stuff? What does it take to succeed in the Christian life? And now this morning, we're going to look at the last character who's uh, in this story, and, it, and he is going to typify sight faith. And his name is Gehazi, and he is a, uh, a servant of Elisha. He's not just any servant. He's like the lead servant. You know, Elisha probably had uh, many younger men that were uh, being uh, mentored by Elisha, um, maybe in the school of prophets. And Gehazi was like his number one guy. And this man was uh, used of the Lord. And um, it's kind of a picture of Elijah had Elisha. And so Elisha has Gehazi. And I'm sure the idea was the, the succession of the leadership of the country, the spiritual leadership was probably headed the direction uh, of Gehazi. And yet uh, we're going to find out that although he is a, a believer, uh, but he ultimately did not have the right stuff. He didn't have the kind of faith in his spiritual walk that, that Elisha had. He didn't have a right faith, but instead he had a sight faith. And you know, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, and I think most of you have heard this verse, for we walk by faith and not by sight. Matter of fact, Paul kind of uh, expands on what that is. He Earlier in that same letter in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 18, he says, while we look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And so as Christians, we live by this mantra that we walk by faith and not by sight. Now, it's something kind of easy to say, but, you know, the reality is, what, what, you know, what does that really mean? I mean, how does that play itself out practically in your life and mine, you know, every single day? Uh, certainly life is no respecter of uh, giving you problems and issues. You know, I'm sure, matter of fact, I'm positive, everybody in here this morning, in one way or another, is going through something in life. Kind of going through the mud in life. I found this picture of, of a couple dogs, not cats, but dogs. Um, and it says this. How deep is the mud? It depends on who you ask. We all go through the same stuff, but we go through differently. You see those two little guys? You know, they went through the same mud, but it really depends on who you ask. How much did it almost uh, get them? <laughs> you know, how deep is the mud? And I don't know. I think that's a kind of a picture um, of maybe strong faith and uh, weaker faith. And I don't know which dog would really typify the stronger faith. Maybe the little one, you know, got it right up to its neck, but kept going, you know, um, that, any, any big tall dog can go through that, but it's the little Yorkies of the world. You know, they're the ones that have great faith. Sight faith versus right faith. Um, now this is Sunday morning, not Wednesday night. Don't normally do this, but Hey, I like to change things up every now and then. So going to do it. Uh, I was just curious uh, this is not a, one of my typical trick questions, right? I'm not asking, I'm not going to set you up, right? It's not a setup question, but just, uh, I was just curious, you know, what do you think it is for a Christian to walk by faith and not by sight? Anybody? When we say that phrase, what, anything come to mind? You know, is God against eyesight? <laughs> you know? Um, I hope not. Uh, I lived a lot of my life with really bad eyes and then I got laser eyes. Yeah. Holly? Okay, Holly says, trust in God even if you don't understand his plan or what the outcome is. All right, that's good. Anybody else? Yeah, Wanda Faye? Yeah. Eyes on the Lord and the spiritual things and not looking at all the things in the world. Yeah. 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 Ye
Okay, keeping your eyes on God and not all the things that are going on around in, in the world. Boy, that's getting more and more challenging, isn't it? Yeah, Pastor Cody? Okay. Okay, so whether it's a quote-unquote spiritual thing or quote-unquote a normal life thing, um, you as a Christian can do all those things through in an avenue of faith. Is that right? That's what you're saying. Then I totally agree. Very good. Anybody else? Thought I saw it. Yeah, Joe. All right. Believe in the promises that are that are clearly laid out in the Word of God. Um, you know, I don't know if anybody here's ever had any eye issues. I know we have a few people here that have eye issues. Um, won't drop any names here, but I, I lived a long time in my life with uh, really poor eyesight. Started wearing glasses when I was four or five years old. So most of my life till I was 30 something, I didn't know anything other than wearing glasses. And uh, at nighttime, when I went to bed, when I took those glasses off for all intents and purposes, you know, whew, and and it's amazing when your eyesight is bad, or if I were to turn all the lights off in here, and then I said, you know, and put, put covers on all the, the doors back there, and then I said, all right, everybody find your way out of here. How would you do that? Crawl. <laughs> I said, I'd find out wherever Russ Gunton was, and I'd go the other direction. Well, you listen to where Russ says, go the other way. Um, you know, take, take one of those. You know, I, I think we'd all begin immediately to feel around. To, you know, all, all of a sudden when you were in the dark, you ever noticed how all your other senses are heightened? You know, you're, you're utilizing other things that, you know, when you can look around with your eyes, you don't, you know, it doesn't really matter. You can see where the door is, hopefully, you know, but if you don't have your eyes, all of a sudden your, your brain is going, okay, how many steps away am I? And then you're feeling out there, okay, feel for the door. Is that the door? You know, no, that's that's DT. Oh, that is not going to move. Um, uh, so go, go around that. Uh, 10 minutes later. Um, uh, <laughs> okay, if some of you missed that one. See, DT, I just insulted you and they didn't even get it. Um, how about that roll tide? You know, how about them? What high school are they going to play next week? Um, Billingsley. Okay. All right. Look out, Billingsley. They're coming for you. Um, you know, I think when it's in, in the spiritual life, Walking by faith is kind of like that idea when all the lights go off and you bring into play other senses. And as a child of God, you've been given the Holy Spirit of God, and we've also been given spiritual disciplines that, that we need to learn. For example, um, when, when Jen and I were first married and, you know, and the kids were little, and I was still wearing glasses, Jenny would tell you, you know, when the lights, if the lights would go out in the middle of the night or whatever, I could get up and go, I didn't really look around nearly as much. I, I, I could move pretty quickly in the dark because I'd lived so long understanding before I went to bed at night, I needed to know where everything was in the room. Does anybody know, anybody else, blind people know what I'm talking about? I want to know if, if there's a box here or something sitting over here. And I memorize that in my head. And then in the middle of the night, I, in our house, I could walk around much quicker because I, I was just trained in my, myself, which is why if she'd leave a laundry basket somewhere after I went to bed, that was a really negative consequence uh, for both of us. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, more for me. Um, so it, it, I think when we walk by faith, it's this idea uh, of, of, of living with a, a, a blindness to the things of this world and being in tuned and seeing the things of God. And this morning, I want you to see, looking at the life of Geh Gehazi, I want to show you some three things about sight faith and the wrong kind of faith and what it sees instead of what it maybe it shouldn't see, or maybe what it should see instead of what it doesn't see, depending on how you want to look at that, all right? If I confused you there. All right, let, let's look at three things, all right? Sight, faith, Second Kings chapter 5. The first thing I want to show you this morning is that sight, faith sees earthly wisdom and not God's wisdom. It sees earthly wisdom and not God's wisdom, all right? Let's pick up on our story. Now, now remember, Naaman has now been healed. He came back to Elisha and offered him a, a bunch of money and some clothes and stuff. And Elisha says, no, I'm not going to take anything from you. So we pick up on our story in verse number 20. The Bible says, but Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said, behold, my master has spared Naaman the Syrian in not receiving at his hands that which he brought. But as the Lord liveth, I will run after him and take somewhat of him. 
Gehazi looks at the decision that his master has made. Elisha says, I don't want anything. Remember, this, these talents of silver would have been hundreds, hundreds of pounds. I mean, you're talking a lot of silver. And changes of clothes, which were very valuable in that day. And, well, our day too. Uh, and, and, and said, what are you doing, Elisha? What do you mean? We have all kinds of needs around here, and you're, you're not going to take anything? Now, don't you, don't you love how, how uh, he comes across here where he says, Behold, how my master hath spared Naaman this Syrian. Do you, do you sense the derision in his voice? You know, the, the, the contempt? He kind of sounds like Jonah. Remember when Jonah went and God used him for this great revival in, in Nineveh? And how does Jonah respond to that? He gets all angry and goes and sits under the juniper tree and, you know, wishes that he might die. And he's angry that God has dared show his grace to people that Jonah hated. There was a, there was a military, a political, uh, a, a racial, you know, uh, problem there a, a hatred there and Gehazi the same deal remember these are the people that had just conquered Israel they just won the major battle and they were have, expressing dominance over them they were causing hardship in Israel and 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 all these people suffering under the influence of the Syrians and Gehazi says you're not going to take anything from this guy are you kidding me and that's not right and so Gehazi says that famous phrase, as the Lord liveth. Now, we studied that last week. If you're watching online, you'll, you'll, you can look last week's sermon. We studied this phrase, and we saw that it's an oath in that day. As the Lord liveth. He's making a commitment. This is what I'm going to do. But remember the difference, though? I don't, did, you, did you detect the difference between when he said, as the Lord liveth, and when, um, when Elisha says, as the Lord liveth? Remember back up in uh, when, when, Eli, when Naaman's offering him all this money and... and Elisha saying, no, I don't want any money. And he, Naaman's urging him, take it, take it, take it. And remember back in verse 16, Elisha says, as the Lord liveth before whom I stand, I'm going to take any. Gehazi leaves that last part out. That before whom I stand, in other words, acknowledging the presence of God and the awareness of God in every decision that he makes. He just makes this bold statement that sounds all spiritual. You know, a lot of people that can talk all spiritual and say, As God, bless God, I'm going to do this. And bless God, I'm going to do that. Really now. And, and sometimes, even inside the church, other places, bless God, I can't believe that, 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 that Pastor Cody made that decision. Bless God, anybody could be smarter than that. Now, you might be right in that one, but probably not. I'm going to go with Pastor Cody on that. He's on my team. I, it sounds all spiritual, but really it was all flesh. And when any time a Christian disrespects or disregards God's ordained leadership in his life, he's demonstrating a sight faith. That, that, uh, that, that, that'll preach. Every time a Christian neglects or disrespects God's ordained leadership in his life, you demonstrate sight faith. Now, I understand, and one of the, the responsibilities of being a pastor is, is there is leadership responsibility. Now, there's a balance to this, and we're going to look at this here in a moment, but um, I know some churches that treat the pastor like he's a pope. That, that, that's an inappropriate deification of mankind. But there ought to be a healthy respect for the position that God has put somebody in in your life. Doesn't mean they're perfect. Maybe Elisha had made some poor decisions in the past. I'm sure a time or two he probably had. But this time, if you in the story, Gehazi was right there. Elisha was pretty convinced of what God's position was on this issue. And instead of... of of evaluating prayerfully and humbly why Elisha made that decision. Instead, he makes a judgment of that decision and says, well, I make a better one. And, and he makes it sound all spiritual. You know, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 13, Paul says, remember them which have the rule over you who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow considering the end of their conversation, their, the way they live their life. He says it again in, in, in Hebrews 13, verse 17. Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls as they must give account. 
that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. Now, Paul reminds them that people like me and, and people in spiritual leadership in your life are going to give an account of their leadership. You don't have to worry about that. But when it comes to being submissive to the, 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 the direction they set in your life, God says you better, you better pay really close attention to that. You know, if you're a, you're a child, you're a teenager here, and you're still living at home, you are under God's ordained leadership structure. As long as you're still living in their house and you're eating their food and all that kind of stuff, I believe there's a, there's, a, there's a spiritual responsibility. And boy, many a teenager, myself included, there were times I thought the decisions my mom and dad made, they were flat out crazy people. And I would say things like this to my parents, you just don't understand. It's different today. All of us old people said, Ugh. no, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Trust me. We do know. Now, I, as I mentioned, don't put your faith in the individual. Your parents are going to make mistakes, and your pastors and your spiritual leadership in your life uh, is going to make mistakes. That's why Paul wrote in, in 1 Corinthians uh, uh, chapter number 2, uh, Paul made it really clear. Uh, he said, actually, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, and my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. Paul said, you know, you guys saw me that I'm a weak individual, that I have problems. God's allowed adversity in my life. He said, but you also saw a demonstration of God's authority and power in my life. Verse five, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. That sight faith sees earthly wisdom, but it neglects, it neglects godly wisdom. You know, there's a lot of times that God's ways are not going to make sense to you. I, I remember when Jenny and I, you know, I'd been saved for a long time, but when, you know, when we figured out and we decided that financially we were going to give back to God, we were financially going to give back to God and give of our, as God had prospered us throughout the week. And as Cody said, you can either give that money by obligation in the sense of you're just oh i'm just going to do this and or maybe manipulation i'm going to do it so god will do this or do you give it by faith god says give back to me and by faith i'm going to obey god and trust him with this and boy what a blessing and if you're not involved in the in the in the principle of giving you're really the bigger loser i reminded of a story many years ago there was a a pastor guy and one of his one of the men of his church and they were out walking on a long walk out in the country and out in the farmland. And as they walked, uh, the, the, the guy that was with his pastor, the, the, he started to develop like those chap, chap lips. You ever notice when you get chap lips and then you want to lick your lips? But then the more you lick your lips, the chapper they get. You ever know what I'm talking about? Some of you guys saying, I need my chap lick now. All across the auditorium, people are putting Carmex and stuff on now. Well, the guy got really dry lips and it cracked lips and it was hurting. And he said, boy, do you know any, anything we can do? We're out in the middle of nowhere. And the pastor said, well, I know, I know an old remedy that they say works. And I, I've heard that it works. And he goes, well, what is it? I'm desperate. I'll do anything. He said, well, you see right yonder over there and that, that, that cow pasture over there? He said, yeah. He said, what you do is you go over there and you get yourself some cow manure. And you take that cow manure and get some fresh stuff and you line it around the edges of your lips. And the guy goes, that sounds crazy. What's that going to do? He said, oh, it's going to do two good things. So number one, it'll soothe them cracking lips. And number two, it'll make sure you don't lick them. <laughs> Sometimes what God asks me to do, let's be real candid here this morning. Sometimes what God asks me to do is like lip licking manure. You say, oh, that doesn't sound spiritual. Has God ever asked you to be nice to somebody who wasn't nice to you? Preacher, right, Nick? God ever told you to meet somebody's need that doesn't deserve to have it met? It don't taste real good in my flesh. And if I look at it with my own earthly vision, I say, no way, Jose. Well, except, excuse me, God, that sounds irreverent. I said, I don't want to do that. But then God, the Holy Spirit says, no, you do that. You do that. And then you say, okay, let God by faith. I'm not doing it because I feel like doing it. I'm not doing it because I think that person deserves it. I'm not doing it because, you know, I'm trying to get anything. I'm doing it because as your servant, you're asking me to. I'm going to trust you with it. That is walking by faith and not by sight. You see, it, 
Sight faith sees earthly wisdom, not God's wisdom. Secondly, this morning, sight faith sees circumstances as God's blessing, not prayer and submission. Oh, it's about to get deep in here now. Let's read down in our story, all right? Uh, verse number 21. So Gehazi, you know, he's made this statement, as the Lord liveth, I'm going to run after him. I'm going to make this right. So Gehazi followed after Naaman, and when Naaman saw him running after him, he lighted down from his chariot to meet him and said, is all well? And he said, all is well. My master has sent me, lie, saying, behold, even now there come to me from Mount Ephraim two young men of the sons of the prophets. Lie, give them, I pray thee, a talent of silver and two changes of garment. Lie, and Naaman said, be content, take two talents. And he urged him and bound two talents of silver in, in two bags and two changes of garments and laid them upon his two of his servants, and they bear them before him. And when he came to the tower, to the edge of town, uh, he took them from their hand and behold, and bestowed them in the house. And he let the men go and they departed. Oh, this is good. Gehazi and all his spiritual pride and his sight faith, all his religion, he runs off after Naaman and he lies to him several times. And he, then he prays to him, not to God, I pray thee, you know, give me this stuff. And he asks him for one talent of silver and two changes of garment. Now, that's a fair amount of silver. But what does Naaman do? Naaman says, why don't you take two talents of silver with the garments? Not one, but two. And if it could get any better at all, Naaman says, and you know what? Hey, servant number one and servant number two. Remember, he's a general. Come here, come here, come here, come here, come here. Pick up that big bag of that silver over there, put it on your back, hike it all the way back to the city. Take it to wherever Gehazi wants it to go. In other words, God not only provided the material, but then he had it delivered, free delivery. But was God in that? Hmm. I don't think that was God. I'm pretty sure... That, that was all flesh and evil. How many times, and I'm, I'm going to be blunt this morning and say that I think most Christians live our spiritual walk with sight faith that is based on circumstances. We determine God's will by when something that we determine is good for us and profitable for us. If that happens, it must be from God. I tell you, Satan will give you a whole bunch of stuff if that's what it'll take to destroy your faith and your life. But we'll pray and say, oh God, I need this and it, boy, would you just do this and then something happens. Oh, I need that. Oh, it must, must be God. Now, I'm not denying that sometimes God works through circumstances, all right? Aren't you thankful that we get to see the hand of God in circumstances in our life? I'm not diminishing that. But I am challenging it as the predominant way that a Christian lives their life. And if the measure of your faith is only determined as you will look around in life and see the good things that happen versus the bad things that happen and all the good things that happen, well, that must be the will of God and the bad things, well, that, that wasn't God. I'm just telling you, you have a very shallow sight faith because we know Gehazi what was his real motive was his real motive to meet the needs of other servants of God no now I gotta tell you I think his motive was twofold I do think one of his motive was he wanted the stuff for himself materialism I do think that's part of it I think the other thing that he was motivated by is he just wanted to take something from that dirty rotten Syrian he just wanted to get some, extract something from him. But where was Gehazi's prayer? Did he ever stop? Where was Gehazi seeking godly counsel? He didn't seek godly counsel because he already knew what the godly counsel felt. And I know a lot of folks and they, they don't want to come ask a pastor what they ought to do because they, they might be afraid what spiritual principle that pastor might bring out. You all know my personal philosophy. I don't, I don't think it's my job to tell you what to do. 
Some of you maybe came from church backgrounds. The guys like me told you where to go and where not to go and what to wear and what not to wear and what music to listen to and what music not to listen to. I'll tell you what I will do. I will preach the principles of the word of God that ought to impact the decisions you make about where you go and where you don't go and the music you listen to and the music you don't listen to. But my responsibility is to give you the principles and the truth clearly based on the word of God and then say, okay, dear, uh, you know, buddy, you're the head of your household. You're the high priest of your home or, or mom. You're, you're the leader in your home or a leader in your home. Hey, it's time for you to make a decision. But are you going to make it just by circumstance? Some years ago, I'm going to tell you a story here, and I, I, I do not mean necessarily to come across judgmental. Um, I understand that sometimes God asks people to do things that uh, might be even counterculture, and I say that cultural, not principally, but counterculture, um, you know, to, uh, you know, to uh, uh, what normally a Christian ought to do. For example, uh, uh, there was a time or two in, in Florida um, that uh, I was after a guy who was battling addictions, and I, I went into a, a bar and to go confront a guy. Now, I don't know if I look back, maybe that wasn't the smartest thing to do. But, you know, some person may have saw me. Oh, I saw a preacher. He was going into a bar. Yeah, I was. I was going there. I was going to drag some guy out by the scruff of his neck. You should have seen the look on his face when he saw me show up in there. You know, hey, you want, you, you want a cold one? No, no, no. I'm about to make it a hot one for you. Um, so I'm, I'm, I don't want to make this overly judgmental, all right? But in principle, I want to be clear. Several years ago, there was a guy that came to me and he was struggling in, in the family with finding a good job. And he wanted a job and he wanted a job and he, he prayed for a job, prayed for a job, prayed for a job. And then, and then he finally gets a job and, and I heard about it through the back channels. And of course, I, you know, I'm not, they don't, they're not going to come to ask me. I'm very seldom am I going to get into your grill unless I've asked you to be committed and you've said to me, yeah, I'm committing to something. And then, maybe, then I probably will. Um, <laughs> How you liking that? You like how I learned. So just don't tell me. If you're going to do something, you just don't say it. Because if you say you're going to do it, then there's, not, there's a possibility I may, I may get in your grill. But he hadn't done that, so I, I was staying out of it until one day he shows up in my office and wanted, you know, he wanted to share me this great praise note that he had. And, and he said, I wanted a job, wanted a job. And he said, I got a job. And I said, you got a job? He said, yeah, I got a job. I said, well, where'd you get a job? He said, I got a job down at the casino. And I said, you know, well, I guess that's, you know, okay, if that's what you feel you need to do, but don't look for any congratulations from me. Because I pray that place uh, not burns down. Well, well, lightning, okay? I'm not talking arson here, okay? I, the, the hand of God, act of God, whatever. I, I, I have no love loss and the place closed tomorrow. I, I, I would be one that was shouting and don't tell me about all the economic jobs it provides and this guy went off on all that. That garbage gambling takes away, it just scavengers the local economy till there's no blood left on the vine. That's all it does. You know, it destroys lives. Gambling is an addiction in many people's lives. Don't get me going on it. That's another message for another time. But I looked at the guy and said, so don't, I said, if you're expecting me to be all happy for you, I'm sorry, my dear friend, but I cannot. Because as a child of God, do you think that's really where you ought to be? Do you think it's the best testimony for a Christian? Well, 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 boy, well, well, he's sad he came in and told me, you know, and I was nice about it. A little nice that I'm telling you now. I'm telling you how I was feeling. I said, do you not believe that, 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 that maybe God and Satan tempts you with this job that looks like it's perfect for you and, and you just grab onto it? Do you not believe that God might be able to provide you a better job that you, you can go to work every day without having to, to be embarrassed about your Christian testimony? You know, the problem is, and the sad fact is, 90% of the churches in this area would care less. Now, your pastor does. Because, as one of the prophets said to one of the Old Testament kings, don't you think that God could give you much more than this? And I'm going to tell you, and maybe I preach this strong and hard, because I've lived a time or two where God called Jenny and I to no financial resources at all. And yeah, it's scary. And yes, sometimes we did without. But are there not some things in your life that are principally that you believe firmly enough in? Now, I know people say, well, if I had to provide for my family. Okay, I, I think there might come a point where there's some legitimacy to that. But you know what? We live in the United States of America. And last I checked, even under the last administration, which of which I was not a very big fan, and we had 6 and 7 and 8 and 9% unemployment, there were other jobs out there. And it's not as if this country was living in the Great Depression. There was no opportunity out there. And even if we were in the Great Depression, do you not think that the more of the Depression, the greater your God is? The greater he can show himself. 
In other words, do you get through life justifying all your decisions based on circumstances? I'm just telling you, as a principal way of life, that's, that's sight faith. That's not right faith. And that's what Gehazi had. Well, as a result of that, I want you to see lastly this morning, and I'll be done. Not only does it see circumstances instead of seeking prayer and submission to God's principles, but number three, sight faith sees severe consequences, not sweet blessing. Look at the, the last part of our story in verse number 25. Uh, but Gehazi went in and stood before his master, and Elisha said unto him, Whence comest thou, Gehazi? And he said, Thy servant went nowhere whither. And he said unto him, Went not mine heart with thee when the man turned again from his chariot to meet thee? Is it a time to receive money and to receive garments and olive gardens and vineyards and sheep and oxen and men servants and maid servants? The leprosy, therefore, of Naaman shall cleave unto thee and unto thy seed forever. And he went out from the presence as a leper as white as snow. Ouch. Severe consequences. You know, Elisha calls him out and Gehazi, who's now, he's focused on earthly treasure. You know, Elisha, I love the way he asked the question, is it a time to receive money and all these things? In other words, Elisha's saying, it's not wrong. There is a time to receive money and sheep and clothing and support. There is a time. But he said, this was not one of them. And you knew that. But Gehazi valued his earthly things more than his spiritual things. Nothing wrong with temporal blessing. Boy, as I mentioned a couple weeks ago, I like, I like folks that God has blessed materially in this life. Nothing wrong with that. But it becomes wrong if that's the source of your faith. You know, the Bible says, set your affection on things above, not on things on earth. Jesus said, lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. You know, Gehazi was about to get called out on this wrong faith, this sight faith. And Elisha kind of does what maybe some of us parents have done. If, you, if you're a parent here this morning and you've ever had a teenager, parents of teenagers who are still alive, okay? <laughs> Let me put that. If you've had teenagers and you're still alive, um, you can still think. You ever had your teenager come in and you didn't know where they were? Now, remember back in the day, you teenagers can remember a day where there were not cell phones. I know y'all teenagers love cell phones, but back when I was a teenager, we didn't have cell phones, so my parents had no idea where I was. <laughs> there was no find your iPhone, you know, app for them. But remember the teenager would come in and you'd say, hey, where you been? And your teenager says, eh, nowhere in particular. Now, this is where, as a good parent, you need to be ready for your comeback question. Then you need to say to them, well, where have you been in general? Uh huh. huh? Tell me where you going to, where you been. And I'll tell you, even before the age of the internet, my dad may be watching this morning or listening this morning. There's somehow, some way, parents always seem to find out even before the age of uh, cell phones. My kids used to say to me, how'd you know, dad? And I'd tell them, God told me. Because he did. Isn't it amazing, parents, how we used to find things out? Divine intervention. Well, Gehazi got called out here. And the foolishness and the hardness of his heart. You know what I found amazing uh, about this whole cir circumstance, this whole story, sad story with Gehazi? This was his number one guy. Now, if you look at the life of Elisha, remember he was the student of Elijah and when Elijah went home, you know, in the chariots of fire and God took him up, remember what Elisha asked? He said, I want a double portion of your spirit. And if you read the book of 2 Kings, you'll find that, you know, that while Elijah did eight miracles, Elisha did 16. He, double the number of miracles are recorded that Elisha did. And at best we can tell, for a great number of them, Gehazi was front and center. Matter of fact, if you read 2 Kings chapter 4, the chapter before this one, read the story. It's the story of the Shunammite woman who had met the needs of Elisha and Elisha had blessed her and her family and had given, they were childless and God gave them a miracle child. And then the child got sick and then the child died. 
And in chapter 4, Elisha and Gehazi go back to the widow's house and Gehazi watches as Elisha, through the power of God, brings this kid back to life. Now, would that leave a mark on you? You know, you know this guy, he knew the power of God. He'd watched it personally in his own life. And yet, over the course of time, this guy got callous towards the things of God and the power of God. He got callous towards the presence of God. And he became so deluded that he thought he could make a decision and somehow God would not know. Now, before you get too hard on old Gehazi, we've all played that part, haven't we? Satan gets you thinking. But you know, I find it amazing that even kids like me who are blessed to grow up in a Christian home, blessed to go to a Christian school. And yet sometimes those of us who've had the most closest access to people that, that demonstrate the power of God are the very ones that become so callous that we think somehow, some way, you know, God won't do nothing. And I'm, I'm of the opinion, it's just my opinion this morning, that some of my, my, my Christian school friends who are wayward this morning, it, it's like they want to poke their face at God and say, I dare you to God. What is a dangerous thing to do? Dangerous thing to do. You know, Gehazi ended up with some of Naaman's wealth, but he also got Naaman's leprosy. Ouch. You, you know probably that leprosy is a picture of sin. We can make that application consistently throughout this chapter. In Naaman's life, it's a picture of his separation eternally from God. In Naaman's life, it's a picture of the believer that lives in his to his flesh and chooses sin. And I know theologically some of you are watching online saying, if he were really a Christian, he couldn't have done this. If he was a genuine believer, he wouldn't have done this. I just want to go, really? I, 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 one of the reasons that Christian school kids, many of them don't live for the Lord after they get older, on the one hand, they see tremendous evidence of the power of God. On the other hand, oftentimes they see tremendous hypocrisy in the leaders of God. You know, believers can choose sin, and I can prove that biblically. David did. David chose adultery, thought about it, did it, and then he used murder to cover it up. King Solomon, who is considered the wisest man, yet... The, the women that God allowed and, and, and the choices he made with his hundreds of wives stole his heart away. King Hezekiah, if you don't know him, good king. But the Babylonians came and Hezekiah chose sin. Peter did. He denied the Lord. Ananias and Sapphira, the husband and wife who sold property and wanted to give, give some of it to the Lord and to the church. And instead of just being honest and saying we're given part of it, they, they made a show of it and said we're given all of it. And you know the rest of that story. You see, you can have those things. But you'll forfeit the sweet blessing of God. You trade away the presence of God in your life. You know, I remember King David, after when he made that decision... He wrote about it when he was broken before God. In Psalm 51, David says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Rejo restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy way, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. You see, David chose his sin, but he didn't choose his consequences. If you know your Bible, it didn't go very well for David, did it? it, it the choice that he made led to devastation in his family. It led to death, murder, the death of a child, rape, all kinds of evil that, that came out of that decision that he made. In other words, don't be deceived by Satan to thinking that the decision that you make only affects you. It doesn't. You know, just because you're a Christian and just because you meet somebody in the church doesn't mean your marriage is going to be automatically a great marriage. I know atheists that have better marriages than regular church attending Christians. Matter of fact, I saw George Barna, the great, uh, he does all that polling data. And, and he, he had a, did a poll of different denominations and the divorce rate. 
non-denominational. If you're non-denominational this morning and you don't stand for nothing, sorry, that was just a, that wasn't really nice, but I said it. Um, they have 34 percent, the largest, the most dangerous place you can be is the non-denominational for your marriage. But the second most dangerous place, Baptist. Um, the the point of this slide is to show that the divorce rate among Christians is really not all that different from the divorce rate of non-believers. Somehow we think, well, if I, if I get, find somebody that says they're a Christian and we go to church, then magically it's all going to be good. No, I want to tell you, if, if you or your spouse or both of you choose to go to the, the path of the flesh, your marriage can be filled with fighting and profanity and abuse and heartache and destruction. And the reason that I take such clear stands and I say, you better put some boundaries in your life and boundaries on, on the relationship you have because you are not guaranteed to be freed from those devastating consequences. Now, Christians can get in addictions just like non-Christians. Christians can get full of bitterness and, and, and possessed by bitterness and anger. All because of sight faith. Instead of humility and godly counsel, instead of choosing obedience. You say, what do you mean? I, I want to show you what the opposite of sight faith is. Real faith, right faith, let's say in your marriage, right faith, if you're having a problem in your marriage and, and you're having verbal confrontation all the time, the Christian who believes God memorizes Proverbs 15.1, a soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. Right faith chooses to believe what God says and say, you know what? I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to give soft answers. I, I'm not going to let things escalate and I'm going to let God sort it out from there. Well, that'll change your marriage. <laughs> your spouse at some point will probably go, hey, how come you're not screaming at me no more? It's not nearly as much fun when you're not screaming at me. How about this one? Proverbs chapter 5, verse number 5. Her feet go down to death. Her steps take hold on hell. Proverbs 5, 5 is talking about immorality and the strange woman, the wicked woman. I know that ABC, NBC, CBS are all going to tell and telling our teenagers that real happiness is found in, in multiple sexual partners and, you know, we don't know what gender we are. You know, we're told that science says that global warming is happening, but also science says there's 105 different genders I don't, I, somebody's lying there, right? Um, they feed our children this lie that somehow physical sexual fulfillment will bring satisfaction in your life and it will not. It's the principle that God says in Proverbs chapter six, can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Can one go upon hot coals and his feet not be burned? In other words, the laws of sowing and reaping, don't, don't they apply? They do. They will. Maybe you've heard this classic, uh, this classic old statement. Sow a thought, reap an action. Sow an action, reap a habit. Sow a habit, reap a character. Sow a character, reap a destiny. You know, you are what you think. Do we think on God's things or our own things? You know, David ended up as you know the story with David, he ended up repenting and he was restored. Hezekiah repented and he was restored. Ananias and Sapphira did not and they was dead. Now 1 John chapter 5 verse 16 tells us there is a sin unto death and then verse 17 goes on and says all unrighteousness is sin and there is a sin not unto death. In other words, in the life of the believer who John is addressing here, Christians, anything we do unrighteous is sin. And John says, you can take it so far that there is a sin unto death, but then there are other sins that God's just going to bring judgment in your life, which is what the, God, or the writer of James says in his book about praying for the, for the sick. He's talking about believers there, then they can be restored. I don't know about you, how long you've lived for the Lord. And I, I certainly can't make the ultimate judgment, but from my limited perspective and what my spirit tells me, I have known Christians. People say they weren't really saved. No, I think they were really saved. But I believe God took them out. 
took them out early. Um, I'm glad that God is patient. I'm glad that this is the rarity, the exception. But I do believe a Christian can sin unto death if they live by sight faith to such a degree. You see, this morning, I guess as a spiritual leader, as a pastor, I'm not asking you, see, please do not answer out loud. <laughs> That's not what I'm asking. Rick, <laughs> you're in heaven. He's probably going to answer. Where have you been? Where have you been? Where have you been on the internet? Where have you been on Friday night? Where have you been when you and your spouse are separated? You can be full of yourself and you can think that, boy, nobody's ever going to find out. Or you can come clean with God. Which is what I'd encourage you to do. Get it right between you and him. Where have you been? You know, I was reminded this week I was going to use something else and then I got an email and it just blessed me so much. And the Lord said, you know, just share that as a demonstration of right faith versus sight faith. I'm so thankful that our church is really big into missions. And I love missionaries and I love the ministries that they have all around the country. You know, our missionaries, through our missionaries, our church never stops, really. Our church never sleeps through our media ministry and different things where things are always going on. Uh, but one of our missionaries that I, that I liked from the very early on, and, and before I even met this guy, when Brother Mike Jones was asking me to consider letting him come and just share what he wanted to do, was Mike was telling me a little bit about this guy, and it's Jim Morgan. And, and Mike's telling me that this guy's pushing 60 years old, and he wants to go to the mission field. I said, he's 60 years old, and he wants to do what? <laughs> That, that, that does not make sense, does it? That is not logical. But many times God's not in man's wisdom. And I thought, any guy that's almost 60 that says, I want to go full-time to the, I'm going to walk away from a job that would offer me financial security if I'd stay at it a few more years. I'm going to walk away from my house. I'm going to go overseas. I'm going to get involved in missions and drive in ministry. I, I, I said, I got to meet this guy. If nothing else, I want to know this guy. And then I met Jim. You know, I all know Brother Jim. Brother Jim's watching. You know, we love Brother Jim because, you know, you're just kind of weird. You fit right. You're an odd Baptist. You're, you're part of this family here. We, he laughs at stuff and has a good time. You know, Brother Jim, you don't quite know what he's going to do. And I'm sure he keeps Brother Mike up at night every now and then um, but if you've been following him on his Facebook and his missionary letters he's been having problems with his eyes he was starting not to be able to see and he went to a doctor there in Romania and they said you know you've got some serious problem we can't fix it here you need to go back to the states so he, he left the mission field he didn't really want to and came back here and had to go through some procedures and he was really nervous there for a while that his eyesight could be permanently gone uh, but praise God, they did some type of laser surgery, did some stuff, and his sight is, is doing really, really well. But one of the things that, was, that I found interesting in his correspondence was the fact that this was the first year in many years that his birthday, he wasn't in Romania, but he was off the field in the States for his birthday. And he shared in one of his, his missions letters and his email, if you, if you get it, that one of the young men that he's been able to reach, and Brother Jim reaches these young adults, these 17-ish to 25-ish age group. I don't know how he reaches them. Some 60-something-year-old guy just has this vibrant ministry. Again, I'd never, I, I'd say, okay, you're going to go to the, over there in the mission field. What are you going to go to the old retirement homes and that kind of stuff? No, 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 this guy. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Brother Jim makes me tired just seeing his itinerary makes me tired. But three in the morning, all of a sudden his phone starts lighting up. Ding, 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 ding. You know, he said, he goes, I knew it was. And all from Romania, which was, you know, the hour, the time difference. They're all sending him happy birthday notices. And one of the young guys sent him a note and, or sent him the text and kept sending it to him. And he said, um, Jim said that he didn't have his phone off, but it's been dinging like crazy because it's my birthday. That's the text he sent. And, the, and this kid, Tony, sent him back saying, I know. He said, I tried. 
He said, not to say birthday, but I wanted to say, I didn't do it because I wanted to say happy birthday. I didn't say happy birthday because I knew it might wake you up. Mike woke you up is what he put on there. <laughs> you know, I might woke you up. He said, but I had to. He said, but I love you freight, which I guess in Romanian means brother. But I love you, brother, so much. You have been and you are a very big blessing in my life. One year from your life, and I am glad that I met you. I am very proud of you helping people to come to Jesus. You know, I saw this morning on Facebook that this young guy led another one of his buddies to Christ, and they're going to church today. All because one guy responding to the call of God didn't look around and say, well, I'm too old for this. Well, I've got a, I've got a, I've got a career. I got, I've got financial security. No, no, God called him to go to Romania and Brother Jim went. And I'll promise you in a stack of Bibles. As a matter of fact, he said it to me many times. He's the only mistake I've made. I should have done this years earlier. Life's going to go by fast. Every tangible thing, every dollar you own is going to be left right here. And only what's done for Christ will last right faith. Lord, thank you so much for the teaching of your word this morning. Thank you for the attentiveness of your folks. Lord, I pray if there's one listening online today that is not sure they're on their way to heaven, Lord, I pray that they would right where they sit, they'd recognize that they're a sinner separated from you by their sin, but that you offer them forgiveness through the finished work of Jesus, through his death, his burial, his resurrection, and that now you offer them by faith the gift of eternal life if they'd simply believe you for it. Lord, I pray they'd make that choice today. And how about it, dear Christian? Where have you been? You know, you live in the, the fake life, the spirit, the fake spiritual life, like Gehazi, acting all spiritual, talking all spiritual, but you, you, you're not doing what you know is right. You might be fooling everybody, but you're not fooling God this morning. You're not fooling him. And as God's representative this morning, I'm telling you, as, as your friend, I'm telling you, there is nothing ahead down that path but heartache and destruction. Why don't you get honest with God this morning? God will forgive you. Start a new path today. Lord, I thank you for this time. Holy Spirit, bring conviction where it is necessary. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.